So this is um, a presentation which uh, culminates the work that we have done over the past uh, six and a half years in the project LiveGenmon in testing different genetic markers. I think we were very, very privileged to have this uh, opportunity to work on a project for six and a half years. So we had enough time to ponder on our forests, visit them again and again, uh, look in our data, in our results, and this has been a very nice experience. So uh, we all know that uh, climatic change is uh, progressing fast and that forest trees are among the organisms which have very limited ability to adjust. In fact, when uh, climatic change or some extreme event due to climatic change uh, falls um, upon the forest, the trees cannot really uh, walk away. I've been walking in the forests for several years and I think I have never seen trees uh, to walk away from stress. Perhaps uh, I saw once um, this tree that you see on the picture, but maybe I'm mistaken. Uh, so overall, the only armor that trees have to survive this uh, stress, uh, this developing stresses, is by the genetic diversity. And in fact, the central dogma of conservation genetics says that genetic variability is beneficial and therefore uh, worth to preserving at the greatest extent. And what stems out of that is that the conservation of biodiversity depends really upon the conservation of genetic diversity and increasing genetic variance does increase the chances of population survival. Okay, so in the conservation of forest genetic resources, what we're looking for is to maintain genetic diversity and designate protected areas in order to do so. But unfortunately, natural forests are not like a vault. We can not lock all the alleles, all the wealth of genetic diversity in there and make sure it stays forever. And in fact, a very simple truth that the keynote speaker at the World UFRO Congress uh, uh, mentioned is that uh, by designating a forest as a protected area or as a gene conservation unit does not really protect this area from the effects of climate change. And under all these uncertainties, the big question is, will adaptive evolution manage to operate under uh, strong environmental change and allow populations to persist. So under these uncertainties, one way to move forward is monitoring. And in fact, the aim of genetic monitoring is to assess the current status of genetic diversity and quantify changes across time with the aim of protecting long-term adaptive potential. So it's a study instrument with a prognostic value. And the way it's being carried out uh, nowadays is by making an application of the so-called gynecological approach. What does that approach say? Well, the major forces of evolution at micro scale are natural selection and genetic drift that leads to different types of differentiation mediated by gene flow that leads to homogenization. So in order to assess genetic monitoring, a number of uh, ways uh, are being forwarded, which culminate to the selection of appropriate indicators and some parameters that are used to verify the indicators, the verifiers. So in the project Lens and Mon, we have opted for three indicators that more or less correspond to the forces of evolution at micro scale. And you can see in the table, the indicators along with the respective verifiers. And you can easily notice that out of the total number of parameters that are used to verify the indicators, most of them, two thirds of them, are based on genetic markers. And this in fact 
poses one question. And the question is, what sort of genetic markers should we use? Should we rely on the de facto choice of the past years, which has been the microsatellites, the nuclear SSR markers, or should we move into SNPs? I will spend the rest of my presentation trying to provide some insight into this question, which is not that simple as it may look. And in particular, the aims of my presentation are first to present the main results of the SNP analysis in two species with different biological attributes that we have used in the project Levzenmon. Uh, fur, Abis alba, Abis borisi regis in Greece, Abis alba in German in Slovenia, and Fagus sylvatica. And then to compare the results we got with SNPs with the results we got with SSRs. The uh, latter will be presented in a number of presentations in this conference, so I will not go into detail about these uh, particular results of microsatellites. Okay, so, so SNP analysis has been done in three populations, in Abis alba and Abis borisi regis, in Germany, Slovenia, and Greece. 124 trees per population, 64 plants per population of natural generation. The genotype in assay used was CASP, uh, originally of 267 SNPs, which in the end, after filtering, ended at 185. And the reference sample origin was from Black Forest in Germany and Mont Ventoux in uh, uh, France. Similar about the SNP analysis of the deeds, uh, three populations again, one per participating country in this project, uh, 146 adult trees per population, per four genetic monitoring population, 72 plants per generation, and after filtering 146 SNPs, originating by the same task assay and the reference sample origin from more than two. Okay, so first of all, let's look at the total number of alleles. On the left side, results from fur. On the right side, results from uh, uh, beads. So uh, what you see here are comparable results for uh, fagus, but you see a, a difference with a less number of total alleles for the Greek populations. I will come back to this later. Um, private alleles. So what you see here is a very interesting graph. So in many private alleles for the German populations, especially for ABS, um, and uh, uh, almost nothing for the Slovenian and Greek populations. So um, what is really uh, happening here? Um, is it a matter of uh, uh, convergence of lineages after the last ice age from different uh, sources uh, uh, coming together in Central Europe? Um, or it has to do with the origin of the reference samples um, that produced these SNPs? I will uh, keep this question standing and maybe we have the chance to talk about this question later on in this presentation. Uh, gene diversity. Uh, of course, you can see that uh, with less number of alleles, the uh, um, Greek samples present less uh, genetic diversity. And if we look into another way of, uh, of checking genetic diversity uh, by taking into account the frequency of uh, uh, individual alleles, you see uh, not the typical violin shape that we usually see, but I can say like a rocket shape for the Greek populations with many alleles showing uh, zero frequency or very, very low frequency. So uh, again, um, keep in mind that the Greek populations are not ABS alba, but they're hybrid further ABS borisi regis. So some loci that may not amplify in encephalonica, maybe not amplifying in the hybrid, and so on. 
And then the inbreeding coefficient. So you see here uh, a higher breeding value for the uh, Greek populations. Um, in fact, in both cases, but please note the difference in scale. Genetic differentiation, okay. Um, I can say pretty much expected results. Uh, the Slovenian and German populations uh, are very close. The double cycle means the adult population and their regeneration, and then the Greek population on the side. And we observe this kind of situation both in uh, uh, fur and also in, uh, in phagus and vatican. Effective population size. Um, this is an interesting case here because we have sort of indicated before that the origin of the reference samples may have affected a bit the results. Um, here we have another case uh, which we, I would like to discuss with you because if we consider some earlier works on what is the threshold for effective population size, um, the older notions talked about a minimum of 50 individuals for effective population size. In fact, I have written a paper about 10 years ago uh, where I argue about this number, but more recent literature and in fact what we have been uh, um, concluding in this Lives and Mon project um, is that we are much safer to consider as a threshold uh, 500 for effective population size. But you can easily see that while in this graph uh, we cover the threshold with the old uh, um, threshold um, indication, if you like, we're definitely half, uh, far away in most cases by considering um, a threshold of um, any 500. So again, uh, it seems that one interesting way we have to discuss about genetic monitoring is also where we define some of the thresholds. There's going to be a presentation about thresholds uh, later on in the conference, uh, so I'm not going to spend any more time on this issue at this point. Um, an interesting result that we can look for by doing this SNP analysis is to look for FST outliers. And there are several methods to do so. This method produced two outlier loci for um, ABS and one outlier locus for um, uh, phagus. Um, and here we see a situation by another test. Uh, you noticed that zero outliers loci have, have been indicated on, uh, but you may see that we have some, but this loci that appear on the graph uh, did not survive the post hoc test. So, um, so in this case, the full discovery rate um, uh, gives us this indication. And when we do a similar test, a hierarchical uh, test, we find out zero outlier loci for uh, ABS, three outlier loci for uh, Fagus. Again, uh, these ones in ABS um, were removed after the post hoc test. Okay, um, this is another interesting uh, um, approach since uh, this approach does not imply structure. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have detected several outlier loci, uh, 16 in one case and 19 in the other case. Um, and no outlier loci by uh, the last method that we have used, um, the outflank method. Okay, so what does this thing tell us? No common outlier loci for fur. And one common outlier locus for bees. So what are these loci since, as you have probably remember from the title, these are uh, gene-based SNPs. Well, we can see here the annotation uh, for this uh, uh, outlier loci. 
And in fact, I would like to point out uh, this uh, ferredoxin family protein that you see likely in the middle of the graph where we have a non-synonymous uh, mutation appearing there. In the other case, this is the common um, outlier locus from all types of analysis, a protein phosphatase locus. So it seems that some sort of selection may be uh, happening there, um, but it's not that pronounced as far as these results are concerned. Okay, so um, I have tried so far to give you an idea of the basic results we got from SNPs. And now I will try to get into um, the next part of this presentation to compare uh, the SNPs with the SSRs. And first, uh, let me start with the uh, total number of alleles. So what we see is that um, uh, we have a similar number of uh, SSR uh, alleles total among the different uh, populations. And in fact, the Greek population has the highest number uh, of alleles in, uh, in uh, uh, neutral SSRs. But when we go to SNPs, you may recall uh, from the original uh, presentation of the graph before that we have less. In fact, we have a 47 SNP deficit in the Greek populations. So why is this happening? Uh, the fact that we uh, don't seem to have big differences in SSRs and DST SSRs, but we have a significant and notable difference in, uh, in SNPs points more and more towards entertainment bias. So it appears that uh, uh, the way our reference, uh, uh, the, this reference samples uh, produced the, um, the way the CASP analysis went on probably has affected uh, the results. And in Borisi Regis, we have less alleles than in the other uh, populations. Now, if we look into the private alleles, this is again something very, very interesting. You may notice that in SSRs, the German population has the least number of private alleles, but the same German population has the highest number of private alleles in SNPs. And I, I do uh, stress again that the, uh, our reference samples uh, came from uh, from Black Forest. Gene diversity, okay. Um, similar levels of gene diversity, a bit less in the Greek populations, a bit higher in the German uh, populations for EST SSRs. But if we take another look on gene diversity, we see that the median uh, is in fact higher, for instance, in the Slovenian. Um, population. So, so these differences are not that um, pronounced. And if we go to the SNPs, you will notice again this rocket shape uh, for the Greek populations due to the small uh, value uh, of um, uh, to having many SNPs with very small uh, value uh, frequency or zero frequency. Okay, um, hart weinberg equilibrium. Here we clearly see that uh, um, Greek populations are not in uh, hard divine equilibrium in large number of loci uh, in SSRs, while the other um, species are. So uh, something that is not seen in the graph is that uh, Greek populations are in hard divine equilibrium regarding EST SSRs. So this also may have to do with a form of a certain bias, in this case, operating in the SSRs, and having to do with the fact that the primers that we have used are ABS-ALBA developed primers. And we applied these primers to abs boris -Regis. So uh, another situation of a potential ascertainment bias coming up here. And of course, um, 
the lower diversity and the lower number of alleles uh, are followed by um, much higher inbreeding detected in the Greek populations for SSRs. Something that we do not see neither in the EST SSRs nor in SNPs. So this is a very interesting result because if we have run for force genetic monitoring only uh, neutral SSRs for these populations, I would be a bit worried about what is happening with the Greek populations here in fur. Um, low diversity, high inbreeding, um, no uh, um, conformation to the hardy weibacher equilibrium. But we see that this is something that doesn't appear in the other type of uh, markers. So in this case, the, the chance we had to work with different marker types really helps a lot to, uh, to get the bigger picture. So that's an interesting result in, in, my, in my view. Um, moving from uh, fur to um, uh, beads, here we have diff uh, sorry, similar numbers of uh, uh, total number of alleles for both SSRs and SNPs. Note that here we do not have EST SSRs. Um, and again, in the private alleles, there is a very interesting situation here. Um, in contrast to what we have seen in, uh, before, uh, the uh, German population has the least uh, number of private alleles in SSRs, but the highest number of private alleles in SNPs. So this is an, an interesting finding, um, which perhaps shows the, uh, the dynamics of the different markers. Um, and um, uh, it's very useful when we decide to, to interpret or to select a marker. So we can see that here. Okay, um, SSR diversity, similar in beads for all populations across the uh, three different countries, a bit less as we recall for the uh, uh, SNPs for the Greek population. And uh, um, if we see um, this uh, uh, other graph for gene diversity, we again realize the uh, uh, low frequency alleles for SNPs for the Greek population especially. For SSRs, the Greek populations and large number of SSRs not in hard development equilibrium, all the others are. And again, if we look in beads for inbreeding, we see this higher inbreeding value for Greek populations for uh, um, um, SSRs. But this has to do with a large number of null alleles that we observe in the Greek populations. For which uh, there might be a chance of some hybridization with uh, um, uh, Fagus orientalis in the past and then back across to Fagus sylvatica. This is not very, very clear, but perhaps this um, difference that we see um, could have to do with that, or of course, it has to do with the absence of hardy warburg equilibrium that we have seen before. Okay, how do the two different markers um, compare? when we estimate genetic distances. So these are nice genetic distances. And we see that they compare very well. Okay, so the Mandel test uh, is uh, uh, highly significant. Um, and something that is very interesting to see, uh, in spite of the fact that it's not directly related to force genetic monitoring, is the fact that um, uh, beads, uh, are further away twice um, the Greek populations from the Central European populations than are 
um, uh, Apis Borisi Regis compared to Apis Alba. Uh, these and some other results show, of course, that uh, by doing for genetic monitoring, we've, we have also incidental findings that have a, a very interesting scientific importance. So by doing sort of a comprehensive study of populations for the purpose of genetic monitoring, we run across some findings of more general uh, inter-scientific interest as well that could have some implication also for the future management of these populations. Um, how many loci um, can discriminate the different cohorts, the different populations um, in comparison of SNPs, sorry, in comparison of SNPs to, to SSRs? So we need about 100 SNPs to pass the discrimination power of 11 SSRs. Uh, 100 SNPs is not very hard to get these days, so uh, uh, pretty easy to get um, uh, um, data set. And I will come to the point that I will try to sort of wrap up and conclude what I have presented so far. So what have we found and what are we looking for in applying a marker system for genetic monitoring? First of all, the main reason we run these markers were to assess genetic variation. Uh, and in this respect, we found ample genetic variation in both the uh, uh, in both Central European populations, German and Slovenian, um, comparable to studies that have been published uh, in the past, um, both in SNPs and and also to a greater extent with uh, with SSRs. Um, the Greek population showed less genetic diversity in SNPs. Um, much less genetic diversity um, in compared to uh, uh, using SSRs, and not that much diversity uh, using uh, EST SSRs. So why is this difference? Is it real, or is it because of a bias? Uh, that's the question. With Doing SNPs, we had the chance to evaluate also another indicator, indicator selection, which in forced genetic monitoring is done uh, mostly by looking into uh, phenological parameters. But the FST outliers give us this opportunity to try to uh, assess this indicator also by the SNPs. And we have some notions that some selection is operating um, in this respect, not very strong ones, but of course we had some indicate indications as I described before. But I think that the main uh, the main issue uh, that we found out, and I would like to stress in this presentation, is a certain uh, bias. So both markers um, showed that and resulted in fewer SNPs in the Greek populations and the high frequency of SSR null alleles in the Greek populations. And I think this is a concern. Uh, this is a concern when we study other species, uh, perhaps not for such a long time, not in such a comprehensive way. We have to make sure that uh, uh, when we are looking into gene-based SNPs, at least, this should derive from rep representative samples of all lineages. So, uh, of course, this can be done by some marker discovery techniques. Uh, but what is interesting is to make sure that uh, um, uh, our reference sample is not coming from a very particular area, or if it is so, um, we have to really consider how uh, wide its application would be into other populations. So uh, beyond that, SNPs have a clear discriminating power. So we need 10 times more SNPs to surpass the discriminating power of, of SSR, which is not that bad. And uh, um, 
With regards to our SNP data set, which was gene linked, of course, small, it's rather small, um, we have found out that the SNPs did not tell us really many more things than we knew from EST SSRs and to a large extent from SSRs. Uh, of course, we have sampled the genome in, in a much higher density, that's, that's for sure. Um, but then having all the different markers available really helped us um, to consider this entertainment bias question. One clear addition that the SNPs have compared to uh, the use of SSRs is the opportunity uh, to test for selection as well, for the indicator selection, besides indicator genetic variation. But in this respect, uh, the, the methods that are available today um, are not really to the level that they can provide um, a single uh, uh, certain answer as far as to how by how far this selection is operating into, and into how many uh, loci. So this is a theoretical discussion. We will not get into that, uh, but it is a limitation in this respect. What I think is really important is to consider that um, from this data set at least, what really matters in my view is that it's not really uh, the marker system that you use per se uh, that is important uh, when you compare to how the primers for its marker system were generated and when you consider to which populations these um, primers will be applied. I think this is an important issue that we have to keep in mind. And of course, um, we have now new approaches to detect SNPs, much more powerful, uh, that in theory, they would allow us to be able to overcome this kind of problems. Or maybe not, because every new uh, SNP detection technique that comes out uh, is supposed to be bulletproof, unless, until when we sort of find that one way or another, there are some caveats that are associated with almost every approach. But again, uh, forest genetic monitoring must proceed with the best available marker or with the best available uh, combination of markers. So um, I would like to thank you all for listening to this presentation. I would like to acknowledge our big project, uh, Life for European Forest Genetic Monitoring system that supported this work and I, I would like to thank all my colleagues for their enormous support and the friendship with that we have developed all over these years. Um, Bruno Fadi, Beppe Benjamin and Andrea Plus for facilitating the use of the, uh, of the CAS passe and in the end to thank you all for uh, uh, your attention to this presentation. Thank you.